Since next week is Tisha B'Av, we're going to review a little bit the significance of this Tzom, this Ta'anis, the day of fasting. As you know, this is not just one day of fast. It is really a period that extends itself over three weeks. It's Kufa, a period that is called Ben HaMetzarim. The many, many troubles that have occurred throughout Jewish history have occurred between the Metzarim, between the various incidents that brought about tremendous sarot and misfortune on this side, which begin with Shiva Asar Betamuz, which is also a day of fast, and culminates with Tisha Be'av. And what's interesting is here is that you have two days of fasting here, which are very, very close to each other. Even though we do have some Gedalia that is close to Yom Kippurim, those two are for different, completely different reasons. Here you actually have two fasts within three weeks of each other for pretty much about the same thing. Even though the Shiva Asabe Tammuz is also for additional things that have happened during that time, they, they pretty much have a lot to do with each other. So obviously this is a very sad part of the year. As the rabbis tell us, as soon as, it begin, as soon as Rosh Chodesh Av comes about, we decrease the amount of Simcha. Simcha, something so beautiful that the rabbis tell us that Torah is Madgisha, emphasizes that Ivdu Tashem Simcha. And here, we're told to diminish, to decrease the amount of Simcha in order that we properly focus on what is going on during this time of the year. This Tisha B'Av is going to be very, very different than the other Tisha B'Av in the past. Because unfortunately, Am Yisrael has suffered a tremendous, tremendous irreplaceable loss with the tragic death of Rabbi Al-Azhar Abu Hatzira, So I felt that it would be only proper to say something about that because that is a hurban. That in itself is a tremendous destruction. It is a destruction not only because of his death, but that it happened in the hands of another Jew. So even though we do not understand the ways of Hashem, there are many, many mysteries, and this is definitely a big mystery in itself. Uh, nevertheless, we have to a little bit see how it ties in to this time of the year because things happen at certain times. We know that things do not happen randomly, they don't happen by chance. Everything is bash gachay in other words, there's a reason for everything. There aren't terrible gezerot from time to time, there are terrible decrees. Nonetheless, these decrees are tied to a time, they don't happen on Purim these kind of things. Many, many times, terrible tragedies have occurred during Ben HaMetzarim, historically. That is why we, one has to be extra careful during this time of the year not to travel for pleasure and not to take any unnecessary risks. Not even to go to court, if you can avoid it at all, because our mazal, the mazal of Amisrael, is low, is weak. So we have a lot of things here to, to understand. Why is our mazal weak? What has exactly happened that has permanently affected our mazal? It's not just back then, Khurban Bayit Rishon Bayit Sheni, our mazal obviously was very, very low. It has remained so during this time of the year especially. So what is going on? During this time of the year, we've had also inquisitions. We have pogroms. We had the terrible Mas'at Slav, the Crusades. Dafka now, even though we've had trouble throughout the whole year, Dafka during this time, there is something that's in the air, a bad energy, as some would want to call, that is uh, giving us all this bad luck. But I don't like to use the word bad luck because it's not just luck. It's obviously uh, something that is guided from above, something that has remained so for many, many generations. And we hope that soon it will go away, obviously with the coming of Mashiach. But in the meantime, as long as we are in Galut, it appears to be that Hashem is trying to remind us of something. Otherwise, think about it. Why fast over something that occurred so long ago? You know, mourning, when you mourn for somebody who had just passed away, a, ch a child, a son, the maximum is 12 months, right? After that, the rabbis tell us, Hamet mishtakeh min alev. The dead person, his memory is diminished. In other words, we forget the pain Baruch Hashem eases. And by the way, that's a big tovah, the chesed that Hashem does with us, that the pain of the loss goes away. 
it's never forgotten completely. <laughs> a parent is a parent, but the pain goes away. Imagine if we had to live with this pain forever, we would not be able to function properly. So Hashem does us a chesed that the pain is diminished with time. And unfortunately, you know, when it comes to Churban Bet HaMikdash too, people go on, life goes on, you know, and uh, people just forget about things that happened in the past. But this is something Hashem does not want us to forget. Even though naturally, life goes on, Hashem says, no, life has to come to a stop. It can't go on. Life does not go on. Life has to come to a stop because you have to take a moment to think about the past, to think and to reflect about what has happened and why it has happened. And guess what? It is up to us to fix it. They did what they did. The problems that occurred in the past were problems of the past, and we have to come along and fix it. It's our responsibility. Yes, because the rabbis tell us, guess what? If the Beit HaMikdash is not rebuilt today, now, at this moment, it's because we have the same problem that they did. So therefore, we are responsible. The same problems that existed in Bayit Shani towards the end of the second temple era exist today. Had they not existed, the Beit HaMikdash would be rebuilt today. And what are the reasons that the Beit HaMikdash were destroyed for? The first one was because of Gilui Arayot Abu Dazaran Shvichut, I mean the three cardinal sins, adultery, murder, right, and idol worshipping. And the second temple was destroyed for a completely different reason. None of the three cardinal sins, but a sin that is equal, if not worse, than those three cardinal sins. And what's that? Sinat Hainam, baseless hatred. Imagine the temple being destroyed for three cardinal sins. Well, I can understand that three major sins. And here we have a second temple being destroyed for something called Sinat Chinam. They didn't care about each other. There was no unity, lack of achdut. They were religious. There was, there was not as much murder. I'm sure there was murder then too, but not as much. Abu Dazara, there was no more Abu Dazara because the Yetzer, the inclination towards worshipping idols, Baruch Hashem was removed. Can you imagine a Yetzer being removed? Back then in the first temple, they actually had this interest that we can't even understand. You know, some, something that would push them, a drive to just look into this thing called Avodah Zarah. Baruch Hashem, that went away. Gilui Arayot, unfortunately, in every generation they had some Gilui Arayot adultery, but that wasn't the main problem. The main problem was Sinat Hinam. Baseless hatred. And as a result of this baseless hatred, HaKadosh Baruch says, you don't need this home. You don't care about it. You don't care about each other. What's the purpose of all of this? You're living in one land and you can't get along? I'm going to disperse you all over the world. Perhaps after being pursued by other nations, by the Gentiles, perhaps when you see how others hate you, you will come to love and respect each other. Maybe that will help a little bit. You know, you know the minorities tend to stick together when they feel they're a minority. And the Jews have been minority not only as a nation all in the world, but all over the, wherever they went. They were always a minority, and they had reason to be uh, afraid. They were reminded from time to time that they were unwelcome, and they were expelled, and they were butchered, right? And so forth. We suffered a lot throughout the history, almost in every country you can imagine. Just read world history. Take a place uh, like, I don't know, Algeria. You know, well, you say Algeria is Muslim. Yeah. Wherever you go, any, almost any country, even if there was a period of history of calm, it didn't last too long. And the reason the calm does not last long is because Hashem wants to remind us, hey, this is Galut, this is not your home, you need to get back to Eretz Israel, you need to want to have the Beit HaMikdash rebuilt. So even in Spain, where the Jews were for a number of years, the Golden Era, as it was called, uh, very, very successful in, in their business, in, in everything, in relationships with, the, with their neighbors, that came to an end too, a very tragic end. Everything comes to an end, because obviously this, this is not where we belong. And even though America, of course, has been very good to us in many ways, and we've been very comfortable, and there's been freedom of religion, don't think this will last forever. Even though the Constitution may last for a while, but the conditions that existed in the past are not necessarily going to last forever. You know, things are not static. They're always changing. The economy, as you know today, is not what it used to be. 
So people are starting to feel the heat, as they say in English. Things are not as good as they used to be. But that's all Shamayim. Even though many of the mistakes of this country are man-made, that's true, man-made mistakes, but there's, uh, there's, there's the big boss, Bashamayim, who obviously has an agenda, has a whole plan, for not only for the Amisa, but for the world. And the world is conducting itself on some level according to his plan, according to Hashem's plan. Therefore, during this time of the year, a Jew needs to be reminded, because the mourning, because the thoughts of the past are no longer fresh in his mind, he needs to be reminded about something that's very, very important that has happened in the past. If it wouldn't be important, then we don't need to remind him. He's reminded about the holidays, too. You know, we celebrate Pesach, even though it happened so many years ago. We celebrate Purim, we celebrate Hanukkah, all these things to remind us of the Nisim, of the miracles, to remind us of the good things that happened too. And that, of course, to build and to strengthen the Kesha, the connection between us, between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that unfortunately sometimes suffers, it weakens. Imagine uh, a son, a child, sees his father, sees how much he does for him, and still there's sometimes a disrespect, there's a lack of appreciation that children have for their parents. They don't realize that until they themselves become parents, and then they say, well, you know, how disrespectful of my child. Well, you were disrespectful of your father too, perhaps, right? Only when they grow up do they see it. When it comes to Hashem, we don't see Him physically. I mean, there's nothing to see. We know of Him. But it's very easy to not see Him, to be distracted from Him, to not realize what He does for us. So we need reminders, and that is what we pray. We pray for it, we make blessings to remind us of a connection that is supposed to exist there. And this connection not only should be there, it should be strong. We should look out for him, we should pray to him, we should consider you know, his will, of course, in everything we do. It's obviously something that man, the human being, needs continuous reminders because that is the, the way, that is the nature of the human being, that he forgets, that he becomes distracted, that he, he does not focus always on what he should be focused. So, Ben HaMetzarim, these days, are not only to remind us of what happened, that they should be continuously fresh, like they're trying to do with all these museums of the Holocaust. Remember the Holocaust. Let it be fresh. Don't forget. Right? People forget it. People who want to deny it, too. So it's not only just to not to forget. Here we're being asked to do something about it. You know, was we actually can do something about it, and that's what's that, that's what's significant about these days: the mourning, the fasting, and uh, real, and the realization that has to be accentuated, has to be strengthened, that actually we are able to do something about it and bring about Mashiach. Believe it or not, we can do it. And some people ask me, Rabbi, if all the generations before us were better than us, they couldn't do it. We can do it. <laughs> it's a good question. They were big rabbis, big tzaddikim, much greater than anyone you can imagine. Before they couldn't do it, we can do it? What's the answer to that question? Anybody want to give me an answer to that question? It's a very good question. Any suggestions? How can we do it if they couldn't do it? Time. What is that? Time, 6,000 years. Actually. Yeah, but it's still up to us. Even though you're right, eventually yeah. Hashem, Hashem is going to bring it regardless, but... We don't want more war. We don't want more tragedy. We, we actually want to do it on our own because it's going to make a big difference. If we don't do it on our own, you're right. Hashem in the end has to do all the work, but then he says it's going to cost you. It's going to be expensive. We don't want that. You know, when a woman gives birth, she can do it in two ways, natural or C-section. Which one is better? Natural. Right? Who needs the surgery? Who needs the cut up? Right? So we wanted us painless and smoothly. If that's the case, we have to do something. Well, they, didn't, they couldn't do it or they didn't do it. How, could, how are we going to do it? Do we have something that they don't have? No. They actually have a lot more than we do. But you know what the good thing here is? It's all cumulative. That's what people don't realize. There is, it is true that we need to do something. And we need to do something immediately. You know, it's important that we, we act right away. Otherwise, chaz v'shalom, you know, things can get very, very difficult. But there is a certain cum accumulation of merits over various generations. 
In other words, we are riding on the shoulder of the previous generations. They were greater than us, so we are riding on the shoulder. In other words, what we do today is so minuscule compared to what they did, but it's the cumulative effect. There is a special merit, actually, for seeing the Mashiach. Being around when he comes. Even though there are people living in this generation of Mashiach, not everyone will have front seats. Don't you want to have front seats? <laughs> right? And not everyone will survive. Not everybody will be around to see it, and to experience it, and to rejoice with it. I'm going to talk a little bit about that towards the end. Who will? What is the, net, the condition for one to actually buy a ticket, or have a ticket, to be when Mashiach comes to see the Bet be rebuilt. But, but you should understand that, that it's not free. You need a ticket. It's a tremendous merit. Could you imagine? Coming of Mashiach is compared to creation. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very, very big event. Not a, a bigger event than Matan Torah even. Bigger, it's, it's one of the biggest events of, of mankind, of all history. That everybody will come, everyone, not just the Jewish people, will come to their realization now, how will that happen? Partially, it will happen because of Tchiyat HaMetim, something that has occurred only once. It has occurred here and there where people were thought to be dead, and they woke up in the cemetery, you know, at the, at the morgue, in the refrigerator. I'm not talking about that kind of Tchiyat HaMetim. I'm talking about the masses. During the time of Yehezkel HaNavi, in the Valley of Bones, as it is called by the Prophet, there was a mass Tchiyat but not everybody is aware of it. Not everybody remembers that it occurred long ago. But for the entire world to become aware, hey, there is my grandfather. There is this person that passed away. There is that woman who was cremated in Auschwitz. Right? For the whole world to see that, on that period it says, Yitgadal v'yitgadal shmei rabah, that his name will be sanctified because everybody will see and everybody will admit and understand that he, he, Hashem, was the one behind the scenes all along. All along, it was him. Of course, we have free will, but he was there all the time managing this, the affairs of this world. So therefore, we're looking forward to this. We want to be around when this happens, but not everybody will. But the fact that this will happen in our, hopefully, without Hashem, our generation, means that there will be an accumulation of merit, an accumulation of ma'asim, and believe it or not, even an accumulation of kaparot. Kaparot. You all, all of you heard about the word kapara. Kapara is an atonement. Uh, whether it was a korban, a sacrifice that was brought about for a sin, or whether it was part of the service of Yom Kippurim through the Kohen Gadol, kaparot was, of course, a big part of the avodah in cleansing ourselves of a sin and in cleansing the nation of sins. Kapara does not take the place of Maasim, however. This is where the Christians make a big mistake. Oh, this guy died for everybody, his blood. Now you can go and do whatever you want and just say, I believe and I believe. Right? People don't realize that the main Kapara or the main uh, thing that, that makes a difference in rebuilding the Kesha with Hashem is teshuva and ma'asim tovim, is repentance and good deeds, then the kapara in a symbolic way helps. Kapara deals with midat adin. It's an, on a very uh, higher, higher level, uh, on a Kabbalistic level, if you want to call it that, on a spiritual level. It deals with certain phenomena that Hashem created in the world that has to do with accusation, it has to do with satan, it has to do with din. But on a more personal level, something closer to us, for us to have a true kapara, we have to make a U-turn. We have to change our ways. We have to actually do something concrete, ma'asi. And that involves changing our ways, if our ways were wrong. Since, of course, throughout the history of Am Yisrael, not too much has happened in a positive way. I mean, there have been, Baruch Hashem, many positive things. The great tzaddikim. But the big problems were still around and all kinds of problems in various locations, in various generations, they didn't have the ability to cure, to cure the, 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 this problem that began with the Qurban Metamikdash. In other words, a lot of ma'asim were done, 
but not of the type, not of the caliber, and, def and unfortunately not by the number of people to be able to cure the problem. So you have masim, you have schuyot, that have not been forgotten, that have accumulated over the years, that Hashem has put away. One of those deeds that is put away and never forgotten by Hashem are tears that are shed. Imagine somebody crying to Hashem, Hashem, you know, I need this, I need that. We're not talking about a new Lexus. Not tears for those kind of things. Yeah. Tears that are really sincere, tears that are, are warm, uh, tears from the bottom of one's heart, whether it's to get married, whether it's to uh, uh, recover from a tremendous illness. Regardless, one really turns to Hashem and begs Him forgiveness and begs Him to help Him. Hashem may not help him right away for reasons that only he knows. Only he knows. This is not the time for you to get married. This is not the time for you to become wealthy. You know, it's not good for you. For Hashem knows why he can't give us what we want. He appreciates that we turn to him, but he says, listen, I know better than you. What you're asking for, I can't give it to you now. Maybe later, but not now. Those tears that have been shed, I put them away in the storage house, in the treasure house. The otsar, ish otsar shel dma'ot, of tears. And they're saved. And what will happen to those tears that are saved? Hashem will use them in future generations. Do you know that your grandmother shed tears for you right before she lit candles? That you should remain Jewish. That you should marry a Jewish girl. That you should be healthy, that you should have panasa. You don't know how many tears she shed? If you were only able to look at her sidur and her tailing, you would see how it was wet with her tears. That is how our mothers and great -mo and great grandmothers were back then. Whether it was in Iran or whether it was in Europe or in North Africa, they were sincere, they were truthful, they were focused, they knew what the power of the prayer is, they knew that before lighting the candles, this is a, a propitious time, and they did so. Yes. Doesn't David Amalek also say in the Tehillim, he says, where are my tears? Are they not in your account? Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. So, yeah, of course, he speaks about the importance yeah. of tears, yes. Because he says the, the, yeah. the gate of tears is never closed. The Gemara says it's that, so right? The, the, even though the gates of prayer have been closed, which does, it doesn't mean locked completely, it's just closed ever since the destruction. But if you use tears, you're able to break through those doors, open them up, master key. Right? That opens up all doors and get through. But Hashem may not necessarily listen or accept the content of, of one's prayer because it may not be realistic or it may not be relevant for the time being. But Hashem says, that, don't worry, the tears that you shed were not lost. The tears that have been shed by thousands of Jews for a great man or woman who was very, very sick and died. You know, it did. Oh, it didn't help. It did help. All those tears don't go to waste. You know, there was Hashem decided that this is the time for her or for him to leave. But all the tears that were shed in the tefillah, in tehillim, for that person to recover, we did our best, are not lost. Hashem uses them later on. There will come a time when we will need those tears. We will need the zechut avot. We will need the merit of our forefathers. All their hard work, all their effort, all their tears will come in handy. So you see, in answer to the, the question we asked before, they worked so much harder than we did. They were great at the kingdom, of course. And therefore, their masim are not lost and not forgotten. And we are riding on their shoulders. So here, we are the, the midgets in compared to the giants. But it's a cu cumulative effort between all the generations, especially together with the previous ones, that Bezat Hashem, we will be so chesum to the Geulah as a result of that. But we still have to do something to, to be able to survive through this whole ordeal, the tribulations of Mashiach, Heble Mashiach, and to be there at the very, very end. But now, going back to, to the beginning of time, in other words, to, to the time that it, this all began. As I said before, there's a, there's a significance to the time. When did it all begin? Did it really begin with the Churban Abayit? The answer is no. The beginning of time of these three weeks is the Chet Ameraglim. It's the sin of the spies. When they came back and they gave a negative report about Israel, that's when it all started, Rabbis tell us. And what did they do? 
very difficult to conquer this land, Eretz Ochret Yoshevea. They spoke Rashon Ara, Dibat Haaretz. They spoke negatively about the land. Yeah. And that report brought about a very, very bad reaction from the Jewish people. They began to cry. Cry? Yeah, but crying for nothing. Not crying for the real reasons. What are you crying for? And what's so bad about crying? Hashem says, I'm upset, and because I'm upset at you for crying for nothing, I will give you now reason to cry in the future, during this time of the year. I will show you what you should cry for. You cried now for nothing? This is something that you cry for? Not only does that show a lack of faith in Hashem's promise, right? Not only is it a lack of faith in His promise, which is a tremendous Chinul Hashem, you believe the spies more than his promise? He took you out of Egypt. He brought the Makot and the Egyptians. He's feeding you. He's taking care of you. And you trust that... You know what this reminds me? It's like the, the brainwashing of the reporters on TV or the radio newscast or the Internet. People actually trust that guy who's sitting behind the desk with a, with a suit and a tie as though he, he, it's gospel. You know, what he says, that's the truth. You know, because they do through their tone and their style of speech, try to convince. They're not neutral. They're not neutral. If, new, if the news was very neutral, people would have a different impression. And unfortunately, that's what they do. The, the media has a tremendous influence over people's uh, thoughts, ideas, and feelings. And here, that's what is happening. You see this already from the Dor Hamidbar. Oh no, what are we going to do? You're taking us to kill us and to fight. And let's go back to Egypt. Wow, so weak, so lack of confidence, so lack of emunah. I mean, what's going on here? But that, that, that is, of course, part of human nature. And of course, Hashem throughout the desert is building up our emunah and our bitachon in Him. And Am Yisrael was very fresh. I'm, I'm, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, of course. Uh, they didn't realize that ultimately Hashem is the one that we should trust and not worry about anything else. Okay, it took time for them, for them to learn this. But people still have the problems today. They don't believe in Hashem's promise. They don't believe in Hashem's word. They don't believe enough. Even though they're religious and observant in all the mitzvot, they're very weak in this area. It's a tremendous ma'ala that one has to work on to acquire this level of emunah. So here we have a situation where Am Yisrael is affected by the report. Hashem says, you cried for nothing. You should not have cried for that. He showed the lack of bitachon. I will give you a reason to cry in the future. And that is what we say, as that we read when we, in, on Tisha B'Av, that Hashem has ma'os, He has detested us. What kind of a language is it? To detest is, is not too good. Hashem detested us? Yeah, it's like He abandoned us. He doesn't care about us. He has left us in the Galu for so long as though he doesn't care. Ma'os means not to care, not to like, to detest. Why does he, the Prophet use those words? Because we also use that kind of a wording, or that, is, that described our behavior, when ma'asnu be'eretz Yisrael, when we detested and showed a lack of interest in Eretz Yisrael. So we see Hashem acting with us in the form of midah kenege midah, measure for measure. But something else is, is already happening. Something else is already happening that is affecting Am Yisrael on a, on, a, on a greater scale. That event of Eretz Yisrael is a one-time event, of course, that will last forever. But there's something else that has weakened us that, is, that makes a, bigger, a big difference, and that is the Shvirat Luchot. The Luchot were broken, the first set. When did that happen? So you're having an event that occurred almost right after they came out of Egypt. Okay, as well. I mean, the Chet Bim too, because they were punished by staying 40 years in the desert. So this was also in the very beginning. But you have another event, which is even more significant, that not only affects a particular day, it affects the entire year. It affects the entire Goral of Am Yisrael in many, many ways. We don't have that much time to talk about that and how the Shvirat al-Luchot, the, the breaking of the first Luchot, affected us in many ways. I'm just going to cover one. And that is that the, the Mazal of Am Yisrael, ever since the Luchot were broken, Nechlash. Our Mazal, 
our, 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 our destiny, our fate, our luck, however you want to call it, has become weakened as a result of the breaking of the Luchot. So because of that, our status or our, our connection to Hashem or our, our, uh, our general mazal in the world, amongst the nations during this time of the year, is weakened. To understand this a little bit better and how it is weakened, think about this. The moment the Bet HaMikdash is destroyed, what happens? All that Koach of the Kedusha that existed as a result of the Temple is gone. The house is gone. So all that Kedusha, all that might, all that Ashpa'ah, all that Shefa and Berachan is gone. It was there, it's gone. You think nothing took its place? There's something else that takes its place. There's a competing force with Kedusha. And that is the Tumah, the Sitra Hara. As the Kabbalah calls it, the other side, the other forces, antagonistic forces, they've taken over. They've become stronger. Look what's happening in Eretz Israel today. What do you have today in Eretz Israel? You have a government. Is this, does this government want to do the will of Hashem? I think the answer is very, very easy. No. They don't even mention it in the Knesset, barely. Why not? They're Jewish, most of them, except for a few Arabs and Druze. Why not? What's wrong? I mean, you're Jewish. Don't you believe in Hashem? No. No? No. Who says? You can believe in evolution, believe in everything, not in Hashem. Because these are neshamot of the Erev Rav. As the Gaon of Vilna speaks a little bit about their shilton, the government of the Erev Rav, right before Mashiach comes. The Zohar mentions it. They are Jews, biologically. The mothers are Jewish. But these are souls of the Erev Rav, of the mixtures of souls, of people that joined Amisai when we left Egypt. I, I, I'm beginning to see another problem here, not just breaking of Luchot, not just the crying here, there's Erev Rav too. Erev Rav, yeah, Erev Rav. They are big troublemakers. They've caused us trouble throughout our history, everywhere. Who are they? They are Jews who don't like Jews. You don't believe me? You read history, you'll find such individuals who did not like Jews. They actually preferred the Christians. They actually worked against the Jews, some of them. It's hard to say and it's hard to believe that this happened. It has happened. And the Nabi said even harsher words. Those who will destroy you and will give you a hard time will come from your midst, from amongst you. Wow. In other words, we are more dangerous to each other, some of us, than the outside world. Why? Because the outside world are messengers of Hashem. They can't harm us. They can't harm us if our connection to Hashem is okay. If they see that the name of God is upon you, they will fear you. They have nothing to, you, know, you have nothing to fear. You follow my statutes, my commandments. You have nothing to worry about. The rain, the economy, the military, everything will be fine. You have to worry about yourselves. Right? You destroy the first temple, you destroy the second temple. You have to worry more about yourself. And in the future, you will have all kinds of instigators who will come from your midst. And they are mostly Erev Rav. So these Neshamot, and some of them may have a long beard too. That, that has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the kind of Neshama that is self-destructive. It is not so divine, and therefore it is not attracted to that which is holy. It is not as interested in it. And if he's Jewish, and he's not divine, and he's not interested in, in doing the divine will, it's a competing force that can be very dangerous. Yes? Can be the sure, it could be all over. It could be, be, be anywhere. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. Anywhere. I said, even religious people, even rabbis, even great people who you think they're great, but they're not. Right? And I'm not going to get into that right now, how to recognize them. There's a, there's a whole lecture on that separately. How you can recognize somebody who's from the Erev Rav. But I can assure you one thing. Anybody who's from the Erev Rav does not have the interest of the Jewish people, first and foremost, you know, was in his agenda. That's not, he, he's more interested in himself than he is. He's not unselfish. A person, any human being who's unselfish is very, very special, even if he's not Jewish. An Erev Rav is very difficult for me to imagine an Erev Rav who's unselfish. Because it, it, it's basically, it, it, unselfishness is, is, is a divine spark of wanting to do 
it's something for the good, for the ultimate good, not for oneself. So anyway, so as a result of the Erev Rav amongst us, we of course have been fighting a lot, unfortunately, in fighting. There's been a lot of uh, machloket, and there's been Sinat Hinam. This Sinat Hinam, therefore, is not something that just crept up one day. It's something that developed over time, and it is something that was learned from others. As I've spoken about it separately, that during the Second Temple era, we had a tremendous amount of influence from the Greeks. And the Greeks were into bodybuilding. They were into themselves. They were into glorifying man versus glorifying God. So all of that influence, all of that contributed to creating a, a Jew that was more interested in himself and not interested in, in, the, in his fellow Jew. So this apathy and indifference for another Jew, of course, uh, brought about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and still continues to this very day. The Torah Kedusha has, however, ways to overcome this through the mitzvot of tzedakah, chesed, bikur cholim, to look over, to care, to show interest. That is what the Torah... Yeah, the problem is that all these mitzvot do not do what they can do if they're not done sincerely, they're not done Hashem Shamaim. They're done just because it's a routine, because I have to do it, I'm obligated to do it. And if I'm too tired, I may not do it, you see? So it lacks the, the simcha, it lacks the excitement, it lacks the, the, the sincerity, and therefore it does not have so much effect. So what we have during this whole Ben HaMetzarim right now is a time period in the history of the Jewish people that the mazal is weak, that the sitra hara has become stronger, the breaking of the luchot as a whole has affected us in, in more than one way, and it's all to remind us how we have become detached from the Torah. We have become detached from Hashem. And as a result of that, we don't have all that strength and all that protection and all the open miracles that we had in the past. And how, does, how does Hashem just allow us to, to, to be like that? Why doesn't He do something? Obviously, He wants us to do it on our own. He can't do everything for us. But he tells us, you can do it. You can bring yourself out of the situation. And therefore, I want you to remember this. And they will have many halachot and minhagim during this period that will remind us what we have to mourn for, what we have lost, and what, what we're missing. The Navi says that it's very, very sad when a great man, a great tzaddik, leaves this world, ve'en ish samlev. Right? Avad Sadiq bin Aretz, Ven Ish Samlev. In other words, the Sadiq is gone and nobody pays attention. That is so sad. Why is that sad? After all, people die all the time. What's so sad that any Ish Samlev that people do not pay attention? People do not pay attention because people do not realize or understand what it means when a Sadiq leaves. When he leaves, he did not only leave, leave us physically, the protection that he offered us while he was alive is also gone. In the same way that the Bet HaMikdash is gone and is no longer there, and therefore all that it represented and all that it offered and gave us is no longer there, and we're suffering as a result of that. The same is true when the Tzaddik leaves. A Tzaddik is that has no replacement. Yes, HaKadosh Baruch has planted, as the rabbis tell us, Tzaddikim Bechol Dor Vador, because we need Tzaddikim. But there's no one that can easily replace the one who we just lost. He was a very, very special tzaddik. He was a very holy man. And there are very, very few like that. You can count them on your hands if you know them. And I don't know too many like that. So it's a tremendous loss. And the Navi said, people do not pay attention. Except for those who knew him, of course, who were close to him. We mourn and we cry and we're in disbelief as to how something like that can happen. Especially that it happens while he was still young. When he was in his, in his best years. And when he was so involved in helping so many thousands of people from, ver from all kinds of communities. Ashkenazim and Sephardim. And in such a tragic way. So what could this be? So I explained a little bit on Shabbat. As it says, Vaitseya Akomi Ber Shaba. So the rabbis ask us, why does the Torah have to tell us that Yaakov left? Ya just tell us Yaakov went to Haran. But the Yitzia of a tzaddik from a makom leaves an impression, it leaves its mark. It has an impact. So when Yaakov left, people felt it, people realized it. Oh, he will be missed. 
if the physical departure of a tzaddik from a country, from a city, makes a difference, can you imagine if he completely leaves this world? Or, it makes a difference. We don't see it right away, but it may, the rabbis are telling us it makes a tremendous difference. And as we said about timing, it's not for nothing that that Parashat Mas'eh is when this is happening. What's in Parashat Mas'eh that we just read? The death of Aharon. And there's mention of Aremi Klat, of Rotzeh, Bishgagav, somebody killing somebody else by accident. Obviously, there's some connection, there's some, re, some, some remis, some hint to what just happened recently in Israel. But the passing of Aharon is unique in that there's the date in the, recorded in the Torah, Rosh Chodesh Av. You have everybody, many people, dying, recorded in the Torah, but without a, without a date. No date. Try to find somebody else's date of when he passed away. Aaron's date is recorded because he was so beloved by the people. Because he has a tremendous influence. More beloved than Moshe, could you imagine? Moshe was the greatest of prophets. Aaron is more beloved by the people. Because he was so close to them. Because he cared about them. He was so involved in them, in their life. Moshe was too, but Moshe had, of course, a different mission. And Aaron was much more, if we can use the English, borrow the English term, down to earth, whereas Moshe was a little bit more above the earth, okay? So he was more involved. And so how much was he involved? He was involved in making peace between husband and wives, ben adam So here you have a tremendous individual who was very involved, therefore beloved by so many people, that his day of death is recorded because it made such a tremendous impact on them, and especially when he dies. You know, it's, who's going to replace him? There was nobody else like Aaron. Was that? No, he was involved in the Egel, but that was because he was trying to push them off. He was trying to do whatever he can to dissuade them. And they asked him, of course, to, to do something. So he, in his way, tried to uh, manipulate the whole situation. And Hashem, of course, was not happy with that, with his partial involvement. But that's, that's, that's something completely different. That's uh, something that is not uh, really related to his passing. So here we have a big tzaddik who had tremendous koach, uh, tremendous hashpan and misail. And in the same way, the, the tragic loss of Rav uh, Lazar Bukhasira is very similar. That it's very, very shocking. It has left a tremendous uh, feeling of void, of emptiness in many, many people. But the greatest difficulty is, of course, trying to understand what this represents. What does this really mean? So the only clue we have so far is the timing. Okay, I'm trying to help myself and those who are trying to figure this out to build a little bit on, on what could this mean. Well, what we do have to go by here is the timing. And the fact that this happens is Ben Hamid Sarim is not a good sign. It means we are at fault somewhere. We are at fault somewhere, and his loss is a reminder. Of course it's a kapara. A kapara means maybe there was going to be terrible decrees on Am Yisrael. And it's a dig of his caliber leaving the world many, many times serves as a kapara. But that is not the only idea here. It is never the only idea, kapara. <laughs> the man could have continued to do so much more good had he been alive. So how could this just be a kapara? It's not just a kapara. So the whole kapara here is, is really, I don't think, primary. I'm not sure, I don't think that it's the primary idea here. The primary idea is that Amisa needs a shocker, a wake-up call sometimes. And here you have Amisa crying. And if you saw pictures of the funeral, you have everybody crying. The tremendous amount of people that, were, that came, uh, that attended, that were shocked, that are still shocked, in such a way that nothing else, had anything else happened, it wouldn't have shocked them as much. Imagine, I don't want to say it, chaz v'shalom. Thousands of Jews would have, been, would have died now. Chaz v'shalom. People would have said, wow, terrible. Maybe we need a better defense. Maybe we have to go get those Arabs or those, and you know, people would have said all kinds of shtuyot nonsense to try to deal with this loss, depending on how it happened. We, we, chemical warfare, uh, atomic bomb, Chasve Shalom, missiles, uh, I don't know. People would have given all kinds of opinions that are heresy. 
heretical, and it was nothing to do with reality, as they do today when they try to explain why we don't have enough water in the Kinetic. Let's go import water from Turkey. Hey, that's how you look at the lack of water? Didn't you read Pashat de Kukotai? What is it supposed to mean? But people don't do that. The Patriot missiles, remember the Patriot missiles that Bush sent us? Had they worked, well, we would have said, thank you, Uncle Sam. You saved us from the missiles of Iraq. Most of them didn't work <laughs> or missed. And they did more damage, some of the pieces that came back. Why? Don't thank U.S., thank him. And those missiles that did hit and did destroy buildings, how many loss, how many loss of life was there? None. Only one, and indirectly. Why? Because Hashem says, hey, it's me, not the United States of America. But that's not what the guy in the news is going to say. We have to be careful with our relations with the USA. They're our best friend, and we need them, and we cannot afford to lose them. Look how everybody else doesn't care about them. Wait a minute, what about him? Nothing's mentioned about him. You know that this is a Hilul Hashem. If everything is a talk is about the United Nations, we, we, we have to be careful. What about, okay, you, don't you want a good relationship with him? See, so therefore, had something else happened that would have been tragic, it wouldn't have shaken up people as much that a religious Jew, forget about a Jew, a religious Jew, a teacher of children, kills a rabbi that he visited and that has helped him, that spent many, many days, weeks, and months in his home. That he should kill him in such a way? Isn't this a shocker? Yeah. This to shake us up a little bit, a little bit, a lot. Um, something's wrong. When homes fall apart, when divorces occur, it's supposed to, it's supposed to shake us up too. What's happening? Why are there so many divorces? 50% of people are getting divorced. People are taking it very callously. How could you be so callous about it? Don't you realize that something is wrong with the system of marriage? People do not know how to live together. People do not know what marriage represents. That's why it's happening. Divorce? When did we hear divorce in the Jewish community years ago and generations ago? How often did you hear about a divorce in Iran? Even if people were not so happy. So she didn't know how to make the choresht. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so what? Right? So what? Did they get divorced over that? Right? They, even if things were not too good, they were not good. Did they get divorced? They, they stuck it out. Husbands that were not home, husbands that were busy selling merchandise, coming home every three, four months, right? That's how it used to be. Are you or abusive, some of the men were abusive, right? Depending from which city in Iran, right? I don't wanna, I don't wanna talk about that. <laughs> they were abusive, some men were abusive, right? But the women said, okay, you know, they, I mean, they, they had no choice. I mean, they didn't think about divorce. You're having divorce, a divorce is a hurban bayit. It's a destruction of a home, like the Betamitash. Aren't we, aren't we gonna do something about it? No. So obviously, something has to be done. If you read the Navi in Pashat Mas'eh, it says that the Kohanim did not ask where Hashem is. A Kohanim, who are the Kohanim? Great leaders of Am Yisrael, Kohanim, lo amru ayya Hashem, tofseh Torah lo yedaunid. Those who learn the Torah, who grab, who hold the Torah, don't know me. Veharu'im, those who, the shepherds, pashobi, they, they went against me. Hanevi'im, the prophets, you know what a prophet is? They want to give prophecy of Abu Dazara. Yirmiyahu, first temple era. What's going on over here? So anyway, there's no doubt that there's something wrong when something like this happens. And this is a time for self-examination to see what, what it is that we're doing that is wrong. And I mentioned on Shabbat that Ir Miklat, a city of refuge that existed back then from those who killed by accident only, Accident meaning unintentionally, I should say. It wasn't completely an accident. It was unintentional. That was a city of refuge where he would spend time till when? Ad, mat, ad, ad mitat koen agadol, until the death of the high priest. Why the high priest? Because the rabbis tell us the high priest, who's such an important person, should have prayed that this shouldn't have happened in his life, that a, that a Jew should be killed unintentionally. Can you imagine this is not intentionally? Unintentionally. Since you didn't pray enough, that's why this happened during your life. You had to hear of such an event that a Jew was killed unintentionally. A guy was going up his ladder and fell down. Whatever, you know, unintentionally. 
So because of that, till the death of the Kohen Gadol. So there's a connection between the death of the Kohen Gadol to this death. And also you, you find in another area in the Torah about Igla Rufa, where a Jew was killed. We're trying to figure out who killed him. There's a special mitzvah about this closest community, city, Jewish city, to where the corpse was found, that they have to come, the Zekenim, the elders, the Yadeno Lo Shafchut, the Tamanaki, it's not our hands that spilled, in other words, we're not responsible, we accompanied him, we took care of him, we, you know, they're involved, they have to atone, they have to confess, they have to focus all of a sudden on this death and not take it lightly, because the death is not something to be taken lightly of any Jew. So the Ir Miklat, the city of refuge that we have today, is the Torah. Why? Because what would happen in the city of refuge with this murderer? He would begin to think, how come it happened to me? How could this happen? Why, why did I... You know, it has happened. The people have driven their car. They didn't see the guy crossing the street, and they ran over him. You know, in some places, in some places of the world, people don't care. You just killed someone. Right? It has happened in this city, too. Somebody killed him. People have been killed. Right? I'm not talking about hit and run. Necessarily. I'm talking about, no, he stopped. But how could this happen to him? Now, obviously, at night, you have to be extra careful not to wear dark clothing, they say, you know, so you should, you know, let others see you when you're crossing when there's no light. But how could this happen in Shemaim? When one would spend time in the Irmi Klat for a number of years sometimes, he would have time to think about what he did wrong during his life that has led to that, has brought him to that. Today there's no real Ir Miklat, so what is the Miklat? The Torah. When a person learns Torah, he learns Sifre Musar, he learns all kinds of things about uh, Judaism, he hopefully will be awakened to examine himself and to realize he's not doing things properly. He doesn't deal with people right, he doesn't deal with Hashem right. Aharon excelled in both areas, Ben Adam Lechavero and Ben Adam Lamakom, between man and God and man. And that is how I explained this is just my own drasha, or why he was buried in Hor HaHar, a mountain on top of a mountain. A very unique situation where that mountain has a mountain above another mountain. He wasn't buried in Everest. Mount Everest, bury him there. <laughs> no. Har represents the mountain of Hashem. Haron elevated himself to great heights. In the, and he elevated himself in Hor HaHar in the two heights, the two mountains, the mountain or the heights in the great levels of Ben Adam Lechavero and Ben Adam Lechavero. In both areas he excelled. So there, there's, this is just a drasha on how Aharon excelled and how this big tzaddik that we lost also excelled in both those two areas. Tremendous kedusha, tremendous tahara, how many days he fasted throughout his life. Incredible. I was told that Chodesh Shilu he would fast every day. Tremendous amount of fasting in Kedusha, and how he would be careful with his eyes. Shminat Ainai was very strong in that family, the Bukhatsira family. And obviously the greater a person is, not only is the loss greater, but also obviously the Kapara is greater. And who knows what terrible decrees may have been ready for Amisai, we don't know. I mean, <laughs> this happens sometimes, that a Sadiq is taking Ne'ara Ane Safat Sadiq, something terrible was about to happen perhaps, Chas Shalom. And this could be associated to it too. But that, as I said before, that's not enough. It's not just the kapara that we're, we're obviously thinking that it's a big kapara. It's a tremendous loss that is supposed to bring us and shock us to cry for something that is really valuable to cry about. Not like the meraglim and not like the people of the generation of the desert. They cry for shtuyot, for, 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 for nothing. What are people crying today? That they don't have all the goodies they used to have, right? That the economy, they're, they're crying for the wrong things. These are the things that you shouldn't cry for. These are, th the Torah tells us, this is something that you should cry for, for the mitat aharon, for the mitat tzadikim. So here, something happens in such a shocking way that everybody is affected, that you can't but think about it. How could this be? How could this have happened? And there's no room to, to say something else. Now, you have to be very careful with just one little detail. In the news, they did come and say, this man has been sent to psychiatric analysis. He was having psychiatric problems. Whether this is true or not, it's dangerous to write that. Even though they may want to do that because it's a tremendous Chilul Hashem, I think that it's not a good thing to say at all. Because it takes away a little bit from the whole, from the severity 
of what happened. He, I, I, I know an individual who knows him very well, the murderer. I know somebody who knows the murderer very well. This is completely normal. Completely normal. I know somebody that knows the murderer here, in this case, who tells me he's completely normal. They know why. How could they kill him? Oh, that's, of course, that's what... That's what's shocking everyone. When was the last time you heard something like that, that a religious Jew should kill a holy man, a rabbi? Ever since Gedalia ben Achikam, I don't think there's been maybe, or maybe one or two, right? You don't hear about these kind of things. But remember what I just we said before, ben Sarim, the timing of these events is, is, uh, is something. It's happening during a time of reflection, of introspection, that we have to think a little bit of what's going on. Yeah, there's all kinds of explanations, but I don't want to mention them because they're shtuyot. He gave me bad advice. <laughs> That's not a reason to kill, so why even talk about it? You see what I mean? It's, uh, it doesn't make sense. And they say he does regret it. He feels terrible about it. And he ran around that day, that same day he ran around in, the, in one of the schools where he taught, or he, he was a substitute, telling the children, that same day, we have to pray that Mashiach ben Yosef should not be killed. Isn't that strange? Because there is a tradition that Mashiach ben Yosef, not ben David, may get killed. So, is this connected to Mashiach ben Yosef? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Why, why is he saying that? So because you see, you see, he's crazy. He's not so crazy. Is he killed Mashiach ben Yosef? No, I didn't say that. So anyway, I, I, he, he is a very normal person. As, as people tell me who know him. So what's going on over here? You know, obviously, uh, it's something beyond us. But the importance of the reaction is what counts here. The reaction has to be that of prayer, of crying, of shedding tears, uh, which is something that we need to do on, on, on Tisha B'Av. Not just to say the keynote, but to really, really feel the loss. Because crying is, is a very high level. It's an outpour of emotion. It's, a person becomes so emotional that the emotions become water in his eyes. Why, do, why does a person cry? Think about it. It's an outpour of the emotions that can no longer be contained and they are expelled outside through the eyes. That is what crying, the tears are. So imagine crying for silly things, as they say, crocodile tears, no? Silly things? This tremendous koach of tears? being spent on shtuyot, on nonsense. It has to be spent on, on, on the right things. And when we do cry for the right things, we are able to expel the sitra hara as well. Because the sitra hara, the other side, the other forces took over ever since the Kedusha was removed. What do you have in the Temple Mount today? Is it empty? Or do you have another structure there? You have that, that gold mask. Isn't that painful? Had it been completely empty, it would have been better. Okay, it's ready. It's empty, ready for the better that should be rebuilt. No, there's something there. It's a thorn in our eyes. Something in place of it. You see how this is more painful? People don't realize it. They go to the Kotel Amaravi, Kotel Amaravi, Baruch Hashem, remnant of the better Hey, look on the other side, what's on the other side where the temple stood. Doesn't it bother you? <laughs> Arabs are walking there, Muslims, not Jews, Kimat, except for a few policemen. Doesn't that bother you? <laughs> See, that's, that's the kind of thing that people don't focus on. They're focused on their vacations, on their stocks, they go up and down. Yeah, they, I take an average human being, average Jew, average American, anybody. You know, what is his focus during the day? Where is the Bet HaMikdash? How come a sheikh is not coming in? <laughs> He's not focused on this. There's no focus. And that, and the problem is, of course, because there's a lot of things in life that distract us. You know, it's not our fault. It happens because we are distracted. But we have to come back and refocus. So to refocus, sometimes we need to be shaken. Tisha B'Av is supposed to shake us up because it's a 24, 25-hour fast. It's not a simple fast from the morning to the evening. It's like Yom Kippur almost. You know, the number of hours and the, the no leather shoes, right? Very similar. To keep on, because, because we need a kapara, we need teshuva. It's similar to that, and they're close to each other. What follows after Av? Elul, Elul. the month of teshuva. So there's a need to bring about teshuva. Unfortunately, there's also a little bit of the cheta egel. 
in every generation. Rabbis tell us that that is also out there. A little bit of the Heta Ekel, of the golden calf. Hashem did not want to destroy the Jewish nation. So he says, you know what, I'm going to collect from you a little bit in every generation. So in every generation, there's a little bit of, of suffering as a result of the Heta Ekel. There's no Ekel today. Why should we suffer for something in the past? So the rabbis tell us it's not the golden calf of back then, it's the golden calf of today. <laughs> because in every generation there is a form of Egil. Money. Mula. Masari. Flus. Uh, whatever you want to call it, right? This is a form of idol. And because of that, because of these idols, people are distracted from what they should be focused on. And because of that, we get hurt. We get hurt because the only reason people... Uh, do not focus is because of all this distraction and this distraction causes a detachment from reality that's what distraction is if you're distracted you are detached from reality what's the reality the reality is the Jew today is in Galut for close to 2,000 years he does not have a home yet even though the infrastructure is being built in Israel today the roads but it's not considered built until the Bet HaMikdash is built so long as we don't have a Bet HaMikdash Yerushalayim is not called built up you go today to Yerushalayim Incredible, surrounded by hills, and today surrounded by homes, surrounded by beautiful, beautiful, Baruch Hashem, beauty. It's one of the prophecies coming true, but it's incomplete yet. It's incomplete until the Bet Hamikdash is built. Therefore, when when one does the right thing during these times to mourn, the first thing that he accomplishes is that he removes little by little, step by step, the sitra hara, the tumah, and that allows. For the, for the Kiddushah to come back, to be restored. That, that, so that's the first thing, is, is to focus and to mourn, because even though we're not rebuilding it yet, we are making room for it. We are showing that we care about this, that we want this. And this is unfortunately something that has not happened strong enough. It has not happened enough. And the reason for that is because, as we said before, there's no Avodah Zarah today, there's no Egil, but there's something similar to it. And that which is similar to the Avodah Zarah somehow takes all of our energy and strength. Because, because what is Avodah Zarah? Avodah Zarah is a system of values. It's a form of religion, of a cult, of a belief that we adapt that satisfies our wishes. So people who want to, for example, they enjoy doing certain things that are prohibited, they'll believe in evolution. Why? Because evolution means there's no God, and therefore I can do whatever I want. You come from a monkey anyway. You come from a big bang. This is not right. You see how psychologically they want to believe in that because it helps them with their value system, with what they want to, how they want to live. Right? Two men want to have, want to get married. Well, how are they going to get married? It's against the Bible. Well, they don't believe in that, of course. They believe in something else. People who want certain things will justify it. And how will they justify? By creating a system or beliefs. That's Avodah Zarah. A, a, a different kind of worship, a different kind of set of values and beliefs. So as long as that, of course, occurs, how can, ever, how can someone ever focus on, on, the, on the emet, when the emet is so contrary to it? And then you have, of course, materialism, which is another problem, another form of Avodah Zarah that is causing uh, you know, people to become distracted as well. Now, in the end, what, what, what would all this do? The, the effect of all this materialism and Avodah uh, Zarah and detachment, the immediate effect it will have is that people will not have enough sense of guilt. They will not feel guilty. They will not, therefore, want to be mit Abel. When do you, when do, when do you really mit Abel? When do you really mourn? When you feel, you know, it's my fault. It's, I'm guilty. Well, well, I'm so sorry. I made a mistake. You say sorry. You say sorry. Who doesn't say sorry? A ganav, a thief. The prophet says that we are like thieves. How are we like thieves? The Jewish nation suffered double, twice as much as anybody else. Twice as much, more than what we deserve we suffered. Double. Why double? So who gets a penalty of double? A thief. If, what's a thief? A thief goes into the night, he doesn't want to be caught by anyone, and he steals when people do not see. When he's caught later on, if he doesn't admit it on his own, he has to pay double. 
as opposed to a robber, armed robber, who robs during the day, who's not afraid. He should use a gun. Why is the punishment of a thief greater than of an armed robber? Because the thief has more fear for human beings than for God. The armed robber doesn't care about anybody. He doesn't care about God, he doesn't care about human beings. He comes with a gun and he steals. But the thief, the ganav at night, you have more fear for the man of the house than you have for him? You pay double. When does the ganav not pay double? If he admits it. Oh, I'm sorry, I admit it here. So what we see here is a connection between a thief and Am Yisrael. Am Yisrael having suffered double, why double? Because they acted like thieves who did not admit their mistake. Had they really admitted their mistake, yeah, it's our fault. That would have been a big step because when you admit, you're able to go and take the next step of restoring <coughs> or rebuilding the connection. Imagine a husband telling his wife, I'm really, really sorry, honey. As long as he doesn't say it 10 times a week. You know, that people always say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but they always continue to make the mistake. That's no good. But if you make a mistake occasionally and you say, I'm sorry, it's very, very valuable. It means a lot to the woman. And the woman, by the way, also have to say, I'm sorry. And sometimes it's hard. It's hard to say, I'm sorry. But that's what it takes to break the ice. That's all. The, sometimes that's all it takes. Do you know that one I'm sorry could save a marriage? Because if, if you don't say I'm sorry and things happen over the years after 10, 15, you lose feelings for your marriage partner. And no marriage counselor can help them. Never, the, the, there was never I'm sorry. There was never efforts for appeasement. There was never, there was never something done to, to at least cover up the ill feelings and all the remarks that were said that were in the wrong place. There was never something done to, to make up for it. So all the scars that are there are not, never going to heal. Hashem says, I still have those scars from the past. They're not healing. You don't say I'm sorry. You don't feel bad. You don't feel guilty. You don't realize what you lost. You don't care about it. Why should I rebuild it? Could you imagine? I mean, that's the way it feels like it upstairs. But when people really say, I'm sorry, I feel bad. I want to, I want to rebuild. I know what I'm missing. I, I want to have it. Hashem, please help. Of course, this is going to make a big difference if you have an, enough Jews doing that. But at any given time, there wasn't enough. The good news is, of course, that what we said earlier on, that it's cumulative. When, over, over time, you have several generations of Jews that Baruch Hashem, hopefully, the, the effort of everybody together will bring about a change that we're waiting for so long. Another reason, and with this, I'll perhaps we'll finish, another explanation of, of why we got double the punishment is the Malbim explains that when you get double, and you, won't, you did not deserve to suffer so much, Hashem says, you know what, I'm going to make Mashiach come faster now. So when Yesurim, when, when pain and suffering is increased, it has a positive effect. It has the effect of bringing about Mashiach earlier. I mean, he has taken so much time, I don't know how much earlier he's going to come, but it could be that as a result of the Holocaust, as a result of all the sacrifices that we've had over the past couple hundred years, including the Inquisition, that we will not know of any more suffering. Hopefully. But we don't know. We don't know that for sure. Look at what just happened. This is a tremendous korban, tremendous sacrifice irreplaceable, tremendous loss that we still can't understand. But hopefully it will have the, the effect, it, it better have the effect of uniting the Jews. It better have the effect of bringing us to our senses that we have to do something. Last but not least, who's going to marry to see Mashiach? So the rabbis tell us, you want to know what the ticket is? If you mourn over Yerushalayim, then you will get to see it rebuilt. Really? I know big tzaddikim who mourned like no one else ever did. And they didn't see Yerushalayim. They passed away many years ago. So what does it mean? They're dead. Three possible explanations. One is, when Tchiyat Amitim comes about, they'll get up first. It takes 40 years for Tchiyat Amitim to be completed, the Kabbalah says. They get up first. They will see it all as it's happening. They get to see more of it. That's one pirush. Second pirush is Hashem brings them back in a reincarnation. Right before Mashiach comes, so they can be part of that generation to see it happening. 
they, they cry so much, they care so much. Hashem says, when I bring you back, I'm bringing you back right before Mashiach comes. So you can see it too. And number three, which is a basic Pashut Pshat, a simple understanding of that, Maman Chazal of that saying of the rabbis, is Kol HaMitabela Rishonim Zochev Rabbi Simchata, meaning depending on how much your mourning was, that is how much your joy will be. It will be relative to the amount of what. The more one mourned, the more one was pained. His joy and his level of, of happiness when Mashiach comes, the level of, of connectivity to what, what will happen will be on a higher level, higher scale than the average individual who will see it too, who will witness it too. Those who mourned will somehow be rewarded much more than everybody else. What is left for us to do is not only to mourn, because I said before, mourning by itself is not enough, fasting is not enough, it's to actually do ma'asim. In ma'asim, I have a list here of ma'asim that I put together of deeds uh, that are important other than just crying, and that is to do the right thing, to do the good thing, to be, to be fair, to be just, um, to of course repair our sins from the past, not to be fakers when we pray, to be sincere, to pray with kavanah, to do things more Hashem Shamaim, to learn Torah on a regular basis, to remember Eretz Yisrael and to stay connected with Eretz Yisrael, not to look down on it, not to speak negatively about it, not to be too connected to the Galut, to the Diaspora, to work and strengthen the area of Mitzvot Ben Adam Lechavero, between man and, and man, to, to have more trust in Hashem, to look forward to the Mashiach, to love every Jew, to be extra, extra careful with Lashon Hara, and for the women to be modest in their way, in the dresses, look at the Goyim today, they're seven-eighths naked, not three-quarters, seven-eighths. There's almost nothing left. Right? So for a Jew to stand out and to be Mikadesh Shem she has to stay apart, a Jewess has to stay apart from that, from their ways. We have to be very, very, very careful not to assimilate the ways of the Goyim, because of course that stands in the way of, of doing all the repair work. Yirmiyahu was told during the time of the Churban, the pending Churban, buy a field in Eretz Israel. Buy a field now? We're about to leave. The place is about to be barren. This is the worst time to invest and buy. No, there will come a time when Yeshuus Kenim, Berchovot Yerushalayim, Unearim. There will come a time when you will see elderly Jews again in the streets of Yerushalayim. You will see kids playing in its alleyways. There will come a time when even though you are saying prophecy about the pending doom, about destruction, about Galut, you mean, I'll buy a field now. The kids are coming home soon. Soon, of course, took almost 2,000 years, but we are lucky. Look at what's going on in Eretz Yisrael today, despite all the difficulties, despite the problems, despite, unfortunately, all the issues that are not too good in the eyes of Hashem, unfortunately, but there's a lot of good happening. There's a lot of Balei Teshuvah, there's a lot of, a lot of homes being rebuilt, for Hashem, the swamps being dried out, the infrastructure being laid out. Obviously, I look at it as a kala, putting on her gown and getting ready to enter the hallway where she's about to meet her groom. So Eretz Israel is preparing itself, but this is the infrastructure. What's still necessary is to really, really look forward to and, and demonstrate to Hashem sincerely in our prayers and in our ma'asim, in our deeds, that we want to repair our ways, we want to reconnect with you, we want to get back together with you, we want to visit Hashem be zocheh, that the Bet HaMikdash yibaneh bimhera v'yamenu amen. Amen.